My guest today is Scott Murray. He calls himself a sparketing coach, which he will explain, and a communication craftsman. So he has spent over 20 years in the content marketing space and extensive educational background in communication. He shares ways that businesses can modernize marketing by making people in communication the central focus of their content strategy and creation. So he calls these modern marketers sparketers. So we'll get into that a little bit in the in the conversation today. We're going to cover his book, which we'll also get into, and why consumers don't like being told what to do and how it actually looks selfish. So we'll dive into that and a whole lot more. So let's get right into it. Hey, awesome. Scott, thank you so much for taking the time today to to talk to me about consumer behavior. This is going to be really interesting. My pleasure, Linda. Thank you for having me. It's great to join you. Yeah, it's, it's going to be fun because I love talking about like how, you know, how consumers and because we're all consumers, you know, how things work and the psychology behind it and everything. And what I love most is the book that you have a part of, which I love the title, The Most Amazing Marketing Book Ever. Now, was that a title you came up with? (laughs) I can't take credit for that title, Uh, (laughs) but it is a great title. I mean, what's kind of interesting about it is, you know, with so many authors involved, it was kind of a a challenge coming up with, you know, with with all the takeaways and all the chapters and all the advice and insights and then having it being led by someone like Mark Schaefer. I mean, it's like, what do we what do we do? And I think it might have even been kind of a good idea slash kind of joke idea, you know, where it's like, hey, what if we just called it the greatest marketing book ever? And then we kind of laughed and then we thought, actually, that's not too bad. So let's run with that. (laughs) (laughs) It's sort of, yeah, it sets the the bar pretty high, though. You know, that's the other thing. (laughs) Yeah, there's a lot of marketing books, but this is the best one. So that's right. Yeah. So maybe you can talk a little bit first about um, about the book because it has a unique approach and also how you ended up writing your chapter on consumer behavior. Yeah, so um, Mark Schaefer has um, a fantastic community of of experts and people who not only bring a lot to the table when it comes to marketing advice, but they're also just great learners and collaborators. Um, we're all learning, you know, because it's like Mark says, today is the slowest day of change in your life, <laughs> <laughs> which means things are just constantly changing fast. So we're all uh, helping each other out in this community and sharing insights and sharing all kinds of advice and insights and conversations um, and interactions in that platform. We use um, Discord to do a lot of things, and um, we're we're constantly learning and we're constantly learning from one another. And um, there was just kind of this idea that um, I don't know if it was Mark or somebody else had that said, "What if we just got some of the uh, experts in the com- um, in our community?" to all get together and try to write a book and everybody makes it really focused and really simple, but impactful where the takeaways are just uh, clear every time you finish a chapter, because it'll be from that individual with that focus on marketing uh, each time around. And uh, so we, you know, everybody kind of aligned with what they were going to do and how it fit. And then Mark's experience as an author and as a best-selling author was invaluable. And he had some people that could also help him on all the other components. Um, so we had a lot of good resources in place, even though the budget was pretty tight. And uh, people, some people like myself were getting into this for the first time, but we somehow pulled it off. <laughs> we yeah. managed to get it all done. And all 36 authors did the voices for their chapter or recorded their, That's right, yeah. um, their chapters for the book. And my chapter came around because I'm, as you know, very focused on human-centered communication and its importance in in uh, modern marketing. And you know, in a way, you feel like that would be its own book. <laughs> It'd be really hard to focus all of that on a chapter. So Mark had just asked, well, what if we talked about the you know the other side of the equation, the consumer behavior, you know, the people you're trying to reach, which is who you're basing all that communication off anyway. Mm-hmm. And I said, absolutely, I can do that because I had already done some research and had some great things to bring to the table after I had finished my master's degree just a few months earlier, and it it worked out. So each chapter is about a specialized part of marketing, and each one has ten takeaways from each chapter. That's cool. And that's such a unique approach. And I didn't know that when you and I first talked. And the only way I've I can relate to that is years and years ago, I used to do recipe development. 
And oh. I'm one of these serial entrepreneurs. I think I've told you this where I've dabbled in everything. And this is way back when. And yeah. a bunch of us contributed recipes for this book. And that's like, that's cool. Like, my name is in there and everybody else. But it was a sort of a compilation of all these people and, and their unique recipes. And so it's kind of like, I would look at that recipe. book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah, always trying cool. stuff like that out. <laughs> yeah. It's because you know that the people who wrote the recipes actually created the recipes. Exactly. But, yeah, because sometimes you test the recipe and it's like, this doesn't even look like what it's supposed <laughs> yeah. to look like. Yeah. Is this the same thing I thought I was building? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? And so the whole, when you said you have your master's, is your master's in specifically in consumer behavior? It's actually focused on um, professional communication and multiple aspects of things that generally uh, involve consumers. So uh -huh. it's professional communication and social media, advertising, writing, PR, leadership. It just covered all the bases and crisis communication, which was also equally fascinating. And it was just backed by deeper things like uh, applied communication theory and things like that. So it covered a lot of ground. Uh, it's built as a Master of Interdisciplinary Studies, and it's a professional communication track. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got that from uh, Southern Utah University, and it was it was a great program. And and I had some things I've been working on that were, rein that were reinforced to be the right things, and then I learned new things along the way. So it was it was a great experience. That sounds really interesting. I'd never heard of that as a major. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, yeah, so. A couple of things I wanted to bring up. So in the book, um, you say that consumers don't being don't like being told what to do. Um, yeah. So what do, what do you mean by that? And you said it looks selfish. So can you get into that a little bit? Sure. So um, that actually um, was an insight I developed while I was um, taking my master's courses. I found this uh, comprehensive study that um, looked at major brands on like Facebook. Um, that were obviously posting on social media and they wanted to see what images, what word choices would actually generate a response and what got ignored. And I, I love the fact those two things were combined because that's kind of the point is either one of those things can generate a response. Any of those things, even if it's an image, can generate a response or send a message. And they noticed that any time those brands, and I'm talking like Nike type brands, um, said something like, come to our big sale or click this or do something, uh, they were instantly ignored. The engagement tanked. Wow. Whereas if there were uh, times where uh, they were much more conversational and trying to generate something that's at least offered an opportunity to have two-way conversations and build you know, a connection, people were much more interested in that. And the thing that I've noticed is um, ever since seeing that study, and it was a recent study, mm -hmm. and then going through this degree program, I'm noticing that platforms like LinkedIn are doing things to dissuade people from doing that. They will actually suppress your posts if you say things like comment below or share this or you know telling people what to do. Because again, like you say, it comes off selfish. It looks more like I made this so that you can do this for me instead of just posting this, hoping it just generates um, value for you or generates a response for you. Because if it offers real value or the content's good, it's going to inspire somebody or spark somebody mm -hmm. to share or comment and they won't have to do it. Mm -hmm. And YouTube is doing this too. I've noticed that YouTube experts are beginning to tell people not to open their videos now with, hey, but before I get to the content, like, subscribe, do all these things for me before I give you what you came to get, because right. it's a real turn off and it looks selfish. And again, YouTube's been around a while, so people know if they like it, they can do those things now. And you need to allow them to do that on their own. I think it's funny because as you say that there's a uh, YouTube channel that I subscribe to, and I notice that what it's one of these listicle things where it's like it, it ten weird things that happen it's like bigfoot stuff and just fast yeah it's weird yeah. things. and what he does is he'll say the first story he'll talk about it and then he'll get into a little commercial for or not so much a commercial but he'll talk about you know something that he's an affiliate for so i bet mm -hmm. that's how some people get around that because he doesn't open with it but it's in there it's the second or third and it's short it's not that annoying but yeah you know. i've also seen people just use 
it's like motion graphics or something while the content is playing. You know, that way I'm I'm not having to just force feed you this idea uh, before we get to the content. But while the content's running, you might see a, a graphic at the bottom that shows a, a click, you know, saying subscribe or something like that. But still, okay. <laughs> you know, I know that if I like it, I mean, there's a, there's actually a lot of channels I visit regularly and just kind of check out yeah. that I don't subscribe to, but I still come back. Uh, I saved them as favorites, and I still know I can go back and get stuff. And of course, YouTube is usually telling me when there's something out anyway. I think that's so interesting because, you know, we have calls to action for a reason. So, you know, as a copywriter, I was told by my instructors that I, I've learned from my coaches that you want to have the call to action, complete the sentence, I want to subscribe or I want to... I don't know if people would say I want to subscribe. Usually it's something a little less in your face. Like I yeah. would like to find out more or, yeah. I mean, do you have any other suggestions? Like what, what would you say instead of click or do you just not say anything? Well, I guess it depends in some cases on the content. I mean, I think there are still blog experts that will tell you, you need to have calls to action. There's obviously websites that will uh, tell you the you know some great ways to test different call to actions on buttons you know as, as mm -hmm. opposed to just saying click here or maybe you're, you're more specific and you say find out more mm -hmm. uh, instead of something you know as general as click here. <laughs> um, I know that there are things you can do too that are a little more SEO friendly, but I think it all comes down to placement. It all comes down to word choice. Instead of saying buy this or come to our big sale come to our big sales a little more um, nuanced because now you're asking people to actually go somewhere versus do something on social media. But instead of saying comment below, you can ask a question that it will inspire people to comment. And if, again, if you don't get those comments, then, you know, test out another question, test out other things that aren't seeming like you're just trying to get boosts on your, on your posts. When it comes to blogs, though, there are times where I will work with a company on closing it with something that doesn't necessarily say, oh, go get this. But I say, hey, if you're interested in learning more about this, or if this is something that interests you, we'll share information here, or you can find out more here, or if there's even a link to get questions, which sometimes is a, is a good lead to um, maybe have someone reach out and ask a question through a form or something. And then they know they're not necessarily being pressured to buy at that moment, but they're still reaching out, which can obviously be valuable. The funniest call to action I've seen um, recently was for a site that specializes in writing humorous copy. Yeah. And instead of saying like, sign up for a newsletter, it said, uh, the next person to fill out the form below gets a free newsletter or something, something to that effect. <laughs> That's great. <It's> a <laughs> <laughs> the person who signs this, you know, filled out this form is going to be is going to win a free newsletter. I, it was just really funny the way they did. I thought that was genius. I, I think that works, too. I think humor, especially because, you know, if you can use humor effectively in copy like that, it just you don't jump to the conclusion as a consumer that, oh, there they go. They want me to do this. That's the real reason why they wrote this. They just wanted me to click on this link. Right. And instead, you know, they might even be poking fun at themselves in that case saying, yeah. you know, yes, we're trying to give you a newsletter. But and even in the newsletter case, you could if you tell people how often they're going to get that newsletter and what's going to be in it, that might be helpful. And they don't jump to the conclusion that, oh, Jesus, just going to be spam in my box every every day or every other day. Right. Right. I'm always changing the wording of to on mine too, because yeah, you know, I learn all these different things. And so and speaking of that, so you talk about like marketing science. And I recently had a post um on LinkedIn go viral that was about the 20, 21 uh phrases to avoid in your copy. And it was all about mm. marketing speak. And so yeah. you say that you don't want to you know, people write things because they say that's how marketing copy sounds. So yeah. what does that mean? So you stop copying marketing science. What do you mean by that? Like, I, I actually use that word um, because I found this old letter. Um, someone shared it on LinkedIn. And it was this old letter this guy was writing to his company. He was uh, way up in the, in the company. This was like a letter that was written like 60 years ago. But the insight was brilliant and relevant because... He could see even then how quickly things were changing mm -hmm. and how things were evolving. And he knew that as times changed, they as a marketing department and an organization would have to evolve with it. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And th- he was talking about how we have to be careful that we've got people on our staff from copywriters to others that can tell you exactly how many touch points you need to have to do this and exactly how this should be structured to be marketing copy. And if it's in this fray or if it's in on this platform or written in for this purpose, it has to be like this, has to be this long, has to use this terminology, can't say this and all this science. He was concerned that if that becomes the norm and we just stick to that, then it's going to start to hurt the organization. Um, And I find that that's a lot of what marketers are struggling with today. And we're not only seeing it on the content side of things where companies are trying to figure out how to personalize and humanize versus sound corporate. I mean, Forrester just released a good study not too long ago, about two or three years ago, talking about words and phrases that people want to see so that when brands talk to them, they sound human. Um, But the other element of that is that um, we have to figure out ways to evolve that as much as possible, Um, not just in copy, but also in areas like automation. Um, Chris Walker from uh, Refine Labs talks about this a lot. You know, we got so heavily invested in technologies, whether it's attribution or or attribution software or something else, those Mm -hmm. algorithms are still playing by those old rules and trying to say, here's exactly what this what this effort got you. But it's missing things like podcast learning of consumers learning about you through podcasts and relationships and conversations on social media. It's not tracking that. So the numbers can be misleading. So it's just a lot of these it's, you know, this is the way we do it because we've always done it. And this is what all marketers know. You should write it this way, do things this way. And that's why there's so much repetition and content today is because a lot of people are still following that marketing science. Yeah, exactly. And that's why AI is picking up on all of that. And that's really how you can yeah. tell when someone's using it heavily is because it'll sound like the same thing. Because I use AI for brainstorming ideas. Um, yeah. I'll have it tighten up some copy and Sometimes I take its advice. Sometimes I don't. And um, yeah, <laughs> it's just funny because it's not a person. It doesn't care what it says to you. And so it's it'll say something like, this is very good. But I think because I'll one time I threw something in it and said, here, just do a spell check on it, make sure I, you know, uh, the punctuation, everything's right. And so, well, this is very good. But we have some suggestions on how to make it better. It's like, I didn't ask you to make that better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who are you? This you is know? great, but we're going to change everything. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <wow>. You know, <laughs> but they, they usually end up throwing in like generalities, like words that you see all over the place that yeah. are like, I've oh, said huge. Post. Yeah. And they love the words, you know, unleash for titles. I don't know. Why. Yes. Unleash the whatever or. You can just tell, and I see this a lot in people posting, you know, they'll use words like that and I can tell it. Okay. You got that from AI. And it's, yeah, it's not there's really bad, but yeah. It's a lot of like grandiose words to like realm in yeah. the realm of digital marketing. You right. start your journey on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and That's then in conclusion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No one talks like that. You know? Right. And it'll take something. What's funny, though, is I play around with it and I'll put, you know, I'll ask it a question. It'll come up with something like that. It's like very corporate speak. And so then I'll say, okay, let me see what it does. This Make this conversational and friendly and have upbeat. And all of a sudden it's got a million exclamation points, which I never use. You're not supposed to use that unless it's really (laughs) like, you know, help. Then you want an exclamation point. But yeah, and then it makes it almost a parody. And there's just, there's a balance that it's not finding, which I'm actually happy about because it's like, okay, you know, I know there's still a need for what I do, but um, yes, yeah, it it does. It'll pull from the internet. So if everyone's writing a certain way, that's what it's going to get. Right. That's great. Yeah. It's actually a a great lesson in what was already kind of a challenging problem in the content space when we were just talking about marketing science, creating repetition when it comes to content. I mean, you're going to find in, in certain spaces um, a, a lot of people that say, well, we got to do marketing. What's digital marketing? Oh, well, it's blogs. Okay. Well, let's, what should we blog about? Well, let's blog about this, this, and this. And then of course, as they develop it for the first time, they don't necessarily realize the 12 other people in their industry wrote blogs just like that, almost the exact same language, only their product. And now you've got bots that are writing 
tons more content for people who don't want to spend a lot of time writing and just put it on the site and say, all right, we've blogged <laughs> and call right. it a day. Check it becomes out. all that much more important to be able to differentiate yourself. And right now that's uh, infusing some humanity into it. You can use, like you said, use it to help kind of focus and maybe provide clarity if you need things that are shorter, but you should still go through it and put your brand's voice on it or your personal voice on it so it doesn't sound corporate or it doesn't sound like AI, like you said. Yeah, it's like all over. You know, I see comments. It is. No, our AI generated. <laughs> yeah. It's like, stop, just be yourself. Yeah, I said, and I was a guest on another podcast, and one of the things I said is that it can, I will write something first. I'll get it as good as I can, and then I'll put it into AI and see if it does anything else with it. But mm -hmm. if I first start by brainstorming ideas on AI, it'll throw me off. Like it'll, it's almost like it takes away my creativity because now yeah. I'm thinking on my own. I'm thinking, well, maybe I should use mm -hmm. that. Like, that's not what I would say. So yeah, it's that fine line, and you know, we're still going to be working through it and just figuring out. You know, but it's a great tool um, when you use it right. Yeah, you know, and so it you does. don't hear like um, communication much in content marketing strategies. So. You say that that's a mistake. Why do you think that's a mistake? And what does that actually mean by communication? Primarily, I mean, like I said, I just got done finishing um, a degree on this. And communication was involved in every ounce of it. Because everything that we're doing communicates directly or indirectly a message to the consumer. Mm -hmm. And the consumer's brain is working really, really fast to figure out what that message is. Mm -hmm. Like if you land on a blog and that blog already sounds corporate or they've linked to themselves in the first sentence, the brain goes up oh, Well, you can tell what this was done for. It's not for us. It's for them. Bye. And they leave, you know, a video uh, that's not providing a lot of value sends certain uh, messages to people. The way something's written um, can sound like it's it's meant to benefit one side. Um, as opposed to both people involved, or at least, you know, in the case of the consumer, the, whoever's looking at the content, everything sends a message. If you land on a website and it looks like it was built in 2003 and there's just stuff all over it, you know, the brain's going to go, well, this means this company doesn't care about the first impression it makes. And the other element is that since there is so much emphasis from the consumers who are the ones who are in control of all of this now, the ones who are in demand and gatekeeping everything, they want humanity. They want conversations. And if we're going to have conversations, we've got to get back to those fundamentals of communication. And we've got to figure out the ways um, to, to obviously vary that depending on who our consumers are, age groups and demographics we're talking to, and how that applies to everything we're doing, because everything communicates a message. It doesn't always have to be talking. It doesn't always have to be copy. But I mean, we're analyzing things all the time. Right. And that's because we are looking at something, hearing something or reading something and interpreting it. And in a day and age where consumers are hit with so many things that communicate a message of clickbait, you know, this trapped me, you know, this is spam. This is just trying to trick me into something. They just want my money. They are making instant judgments on whatever message they think that content is conveying to to them. And we have to start getting back to a more human focus on how our content communicates me messages to them. So they give us the responses we're looking for that help them and help our businesses. Yeah. Well, is there like either one big tip or a couple things that that companies can do to improve their communication so that it is more human people focused? I think one of the best things you can do is to stop thinking like a marketer. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you are a marketer. <laughs> Even if you are a marketer. And this is coming from a marketer. Um, the reason why I say that is because for a couple of reasons. One, um, we sometimes have a tendency to create content as marketers that we would not even look at as a consumer. Mm -hmm. It's almost like that consumer brain is turned off when we go to work and then we turn it on and then we're we're you know we're skipping over things, we're blocking things, you know, advertisements and things that look spammy or not very helpful. 
Uh, but then we go to work and we might make something <laughs> that's very consistent with the things that we don't like when our consumer brain is on. Right. And one of the things that I've talked a lot about is, you know, sometimes one of the things we can do is just change the way we're thinking as marketers to begin with. And some of that is rooted in the terminology. It's very much like how motivational speakers will say, you know, if you're struggling with this, don't think of it this way. Think of it this way, because this has kind of a negative connotation and it might be holding you back because it's not a great thing to think about, or it might just be causing barriers, um, you know, in front of you that might be stifling your progress because you're thinking this way instead of this way. And I think marketing can do the same thing. That's why I talk about sparketing instead of marketing, because the very definition of marketing and marketing strategy has words sell and promote in them. And that's the thing that consumers really hate, at least as far as it being um, like the center of the content. So I, I have told people that one of the things you can do is your marketing department, instead of having a marketing strategy where you might be focused on how can we achieve these numbers, how can we get them to click on this, or they know they need this, or we've got to convince them they need this, say instead that you're developing a relationship foundation, which is focusing on questions like, how do we tap into their needs? How do we lower their skepticism? And how do we spark the best reaction? A couple of other terms that are very prevalent in marketing departments, obviously, is lead nurturing and conversion. <laughs> you know, and the very word conversion, if someone said, I'm going to convert you to this, you probably would be a little uncomfortable. And I, I've used the example of that old 1980 series V when the you know, the aliens were always trying to uh, convert humans to their side through this really painful process. So instead of lead nurturing, which really can cause several challenges, if if you're really just focused on, can we get leads? We've got to get leads. And again, it's kind of numbers focused. Those numbers diminish humanity. There is a focus on scale over effectiveness, mm -hmm. and there's a high threat of negative response sometimes. Um, instead of saying you're lead nurturing, you could say you're value cultivating or you're creating value cultivation, which is a human focused effort. Mm -hmm. um, you're focused on lifetime value for you and the consumer and there's mutual benefits. And then with conversion, instead of thinking we've got conversion basically means we've got to make these consumers want this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we've got to make them do it. We've got to make them want what we what we're offering instead of calling it a conversion rate or measuring conversions, how about we have a validation rate and make it more about validation, which is instead of saying, you know, we've got to achieve making them want this, validate it and prove how are we proving to them that we can help them. So sometimes just changing that terminology, which is really rooted in numbers, that marketing science and kind of that one way communication, we start changing how we talk about what we're doing in our marketing departments in ways that automatically start getting us focused on more value-driven, human, and conversational marketing. I love that, especially at the beginning when you said about the consumer brain and the marketing brain. Yeah, That's so important because it, when I talk to my clients and we're looking at their website or, or if I'm just evaluating on my own and I look at the header, you know, the big headline, nine out of 10 times, no one ever says that. You know, like, yeah. it's like, do people wake up and say, you know, it's it's all marketing speak. No one wakes up and says that. And that's the, the one quick way to know if you are, you know, speaking to your your customer or just thinking or guessing about what they might want, because they usually don't use the same words that you would use. That's true. Yeah. The other thing that I I've even experienced for myself that as I um, started to do more and more content over my career, I mean, I'm very much a right brain creative so there were plenty of times where I would have to develop um, creative elements and copy or content. And what I noticed over time was I had to be careful sometimes that I wasn't so focused on what I thought was great or sounded cool. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't matter what I think because I was it was they weren't selling to me. Right. They were you know, we are trying to um, connect with somebody else. So I had to make sure I wasn't just, we all weren't just thinking internally on what we thought was great. Right. We had to make sure this was something that was going to resonate with our audience, which is why you've got um, so much emphasis now on research and audience research and market research, which by the way, uh, there's a chapter in that book on that too. Oh. Um, 
Yeah. And it's, it's really well done. That actually comes, uh, it's connected to mine. I think it's right before mine. So there's some good synergy there. It's it's cool. Yeah. And it's interesting when I, I always, there's a phrase and it's not something I came up with, but I heard it on a podcast where when you create like a value proposition in a boardroom without any kind of outside input from your customers, they call it mm-hmm. in, companies inhaling their own fumes, you know, like you're just, <laughs> just, wow. you're just patting each other on the back. This is just <laughs> great. And, and no one's ever said what you think they're going to be saying or thinking. And there's many times I'm writing copy and I think I came up with a great analogy or something that you know, really will will resonate. But then uh, when I look at, is it something that the reader in this particular niche would ever relate to? And if it's no, it doesn't matter how brilliant I think it is, I got to get rid of it. And it's it's hard because, you know, sometimes it's like, this was really good, but, but it's not going to fit. So you yeah. have. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I know you've also talked about um, the importance of testing. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if if some of that failure or some of that, um, you know, content isn't working. If it's if it's rooted in a plan for testing, meaning you've recognized this isn't resonating um, and you're going to make changes, you're going to try something else, then it's fine. We're all going to have those moments. The The thing that looks bad and works against us is when we will basically uh, experience the definition of insanity, which is <laughs> we're trying the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, this has been awesome, Scott. I really appreciate you taking the time. Where can people um, find you and find your book? And uh... Yeah, I I appreciate it. Um, My website is scottmurray, M-U-R-R-A-Y, online.com. I can be reached there. And I'm also on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And the book is on Amazon. I assume that's where most people are going to go. But what's cool, as I mentioned before, is Whatever format you want, it's there. You can get physical copies, digital copies, or audio copy. But if you get that audio book, obviously, you'll hear voices from all over the world and all the different authors, um, 36 authors that contributed to that book. So we've gotten some really good reviews on that. I think we're up to like uh, 50-something reviews, and it's been uh, well-received. And I hope if um, your listeners have a chance to give it a look that... um, they'll also have a chance to share what they thought of it. And you know, if you, I have Kindle Unlimited and it's actually free if you are in Kindle Unlimited. So I'm going to put all those links in the show notes so people can access them easily. So thank you again. I I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. It has. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate you.